Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life in me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. So how is it with your soul today? I used to have a a supervisor, a district superintendent, who every time I met with her, she'd ask me that question, Dave, how is it with your soul? Now that question wasn't of her origination, it came from John Wesley the founder of the Methodist movement. It was part of the the questions that would have been asked at every class and society meeting that were, you know, the small groups that, that really were at the heart of the Methodist movement. How is it with your soul? I always experienced it to be a very difficult question to answer. I mean, it puts you off balance, right? Like, like it pierces, like, what is a soul? How do you name it, describe it? I mean, how would I know its condition? What is a soul to begin with? In 1590, Christopher Marlowe wrote a play called The Tragical History of the Life and Death of Dr. Faustus. It was based on kind of German uh, folklore. And and the story has been told and retold in so many variations that we're all likely familiar with it. Dr. Faustus is, is like any of us, he's a man who is dissatisfied with his own life. But in order to achieve the life that he's always wanted, he makes a deal with the devil, or specifically with one of the devil's emissaries, Mephistopheles. And the deal is this, that for 24 years, he has absolute control over Mephistopheles, who will give to him power, fame, fortune, the life he's always wanted. But at the end of the 24 years, his soul will belong to the devil. Now at the beginning, uh, Faustus enjoys this life that he's received and doesn't think one bit about the soul which he has forfeited, but as the 24 years begin to draw to an end, do you guys hear that too? (laughs) Well, I thought it was maybe like a timer, like the 24 years drawing to an end. But as the 24 years begin to draw to an end, He begins to be filled with torment and anguish. What have I done? How how can I get out of this deal that I've made? And and, and the play ends with with Faustus being dragged off to face the consequences of a very foolish decision. Now, it's very easy for us as the audience to see this and to think to ourselves, what a fool Faustus is. I mean, who signs a deal with the devil? You're never going to win, right? unless you're Johnny going down to Georgia, of course, but otherwise you don't win that bet. But it's meant to be a warning to all of us because all of us sometimes fail to reckon with the value of our souls. And every single one of us makes decisions sometimes that that in the immediate moment feel necessary or expedient if we want the life that we really want and we fail to take into account the consequences that are down the road. And the only thing I would kind of challenge about the play and its, and its symbolism is that, you know, it kind of speaks of the soul as if it's only something that, that lives on after we die. Like we don't really notice the price of the soul until that moment. But the teaching of the Bible is that the soul and the body are connected. We are both body and spirit. And we can't be whole without a soul. So when we give up our soul for something else, we feel it. 
in the here and now, in this life and in the next. My, my understanding of the soul has, has been kind of shaped, uh, I guess forever, by a book I read called Present Over Perfect by Shauna Nyquist. Um, Shauna, she begins with a, a, a Christmas song that uh, we've all heard a million times, and I guess, you know, we can go ahead and turn to Christmas, right? We're past Halloween. Like, Target already has all their decorations out. Hallmark showed their first Christmas movies over the weekend, so we're going to switch to Christmas here for a moment. But the song that she reflects on is, Oh, Holy Night. And you know how the song goes, Oh, Holy Night. The stars are brightly shining. You can sing with me. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Now, I know you want to go on from there, but we're going to pause (laughs) because that's where Shauna asked the question. What does it mean for the soul to feel its worth? I mean, worth is one of those central questions in all of our lives. How do we understand our worth? How how do we find our value? How do we know that our lives matter? And the way that most of us try to prove our worth is by accomplishment and achievement, as if worth is something that has to be earned or proven. And so we set out to to prove that we matter. And we do that by pushing hard and burning the candles at both ends and and trying to achieve. And so that if anyone doubts our value, we can trot out all of our credentials. We can say, look at all the stuff I've done. My life matters. But Shauna, reflecting on the question, says, you know, the value of the soul does not come from our accomplishments or achievements. It can't be proven. It can't be earned. She says, I know I've tried. She says, I've spent my whole life trying to prove my worth on the battlefield. And I didn't recognize in that moment that I was making a Faustian trade. That by burning the candle at both ends and trying to prove my worth, I was actually doing damage to my soul. Here's how she says it. She says, many of us, myself included, considered our souls necessary collateral damage to get done the things we felt simply had to get done because of other people's expectations, because we want to be known as highly capable, because we are trying to outrun an inner emptiness. For a while, we don't even recognize the compromise we've made. We're on autopilot. We're chugging through the day on fear and caffeine, checking things off the list, falling into bed without even a real thought of feeling or connection all day long. Just have, we just have a sense of having made it through. Does that resonate with anyone? We begin to think the soul is expendable, a luxury maybe, something optional but certainly not required. So what is the soul? Is it optional? If it is required, then what is the function of a soul in our lives? Well, Shauna suggests that the soul's purpose is ultimately about connection. The soul is how we connect to God, to people, to nature, to art. Without the soul, there is no connection. She says, you know, a, a robot, a soul is not required for a robot or for a machine or for a set of ideas or theories but a soul is profoundly necessary for a human. Without a soul, you can walk, drive, sleep, but you can't love, you can't weep, you can't feel, because it's from our souls that we love, that we feel, that we create, that we connect. So if we take that understanding of the soul back into Jesus' words, Jesus asked the question, what good does it do someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul. The whole world there means the life you've always wanted, 
I mean, the job you've always wanted, the body you've always envied, the wealth, the experiences that you've always craved. What good does it do you, Jesus asked, if you get all those things, but in the process of getting them, you've laid down the one thing that enables you to connect? Then you can't taste, touch, feel, enjoy, share all these good things that you've spent your life acquiring. So what good is it to you then? Your life still ends up empty. Shauna puts it this way. She says, many of us have been living the life that we thought we always wanted, but just under the surface of that lovely life is exhaustion and isolation and emptiness. It doesn't matter how pretty things look on the outside if on the inside there's an ache from a lifetime of trying to prove your worth. All those things you wanted out there, the world as it were, you can't feel or taste or touch those things without a soul. And so what good are they to you if you gain them at the expense of the softest, most precious part of you? Whatever, you achieve, whatever you've achieved, wherever you've arrived, whatever it is, if in order to get there you laid down your soul, believing it was unnecessary baggage or an acceptable sacrifice, I'm here to tell you with great love and tenderness that you're wrong. Have you ever laid down your soul? And if you have, how do you ever get it back? There's an old adage in the business world that says, don't make perfect the enemy of good. I first heard it reading Jim Collins, but actually it goes all the way back to the philosopher Voltaire. And what he meant by that, or at least what Jim Collins, kind of the way he expounds, he says there's a diminishing return Every time we're pursuing perfection, perfectionism ends up destroying us because we end up pouring more time and more energy into things that don't really have that much impact. We'd be much better off taking our time and energy that we would have spent trying to make it perfect and instead focus on making it good. And I think sometimes that applies to the spiritual life as well. That the more we focus on being perfect, on getting it all right, on, on, on having perfect attendance at church or perfect prayers or perfect whatever, we, we, we end up crushing our spirit because none of us can be perfect under the law. And that chasing of the perfect blinds us to the goodness that exists all around us every single day. So let me give you a, a mantra, so to speak. The name of Shauna's book was Present Over Perfect, but I'd like to to suggest a change in wording. Instead of present over perfect, let me suggest this. Connection over perfection. What would it look like in your life, just this week maybe, if as you went through your daily activities, every morning you woke up and every time you had lunch and every time you met someone, you just repeated in your mind, connection over perfection. What would that look like in your home, for instance? What would it look like if we pursued connection over perfection? Because I think every single one of us, we have these images of what the perfect home looks like. And it's not just the way our home looks, although we have images of what our home should look like that we never seem to measure up to. But, but, but I'm also talking about the relationships that are there. We have this picture of the perfect family, of perfect marriage and perfect kids. And, and when we foist our expectation of perfection on other people, they will never be able to reach up. When we foist them on ourselves, we'll never be able to reach up. So to pursue connection over perfection means that we, we just choose to connect with the people that God has given us to share life with. And we embrace them with all of their faults. And that means embracing yourself with all of your faults as well. If we pursue connection over perfection, then we stay connected to each other. Even when life gets messy, even when life gets busy, we accept that there's some brokenness in relationships, but in the midst of that, the most important thing is love. What would it look like if we pursued connection over perfection in our work? Some of us are very driven by goals, I know that. 
But I think if we were to pursue connection over perfection, we might hold on to those goals just a little bit looser. Because to pursue per- connection over perfection means that you, you value relationships. You try to connect with people, whether it's the people you report to or the people who report to you or your coworkers or, or the students or clients that you serve. When you pursue per- connection over perfection, It takes your activity, your work, and makes it into service. Because it's no longer about your performance. I think a lot of times when we ask the question, did you do good, did you do well, we we tend to think in terms of performance. Well, I could have done better. But what if did you do well isn't about performance, but what if it's like, did you bring well-being into the lives of others? Did you bring good things into the world? That's what connection over perfection means. And what about in your faith? What if you pursue connection over perfection in your faith? What if you weren't worried about if you pray enough or read enough scripture or come to church often enough or do enough good or give enough? For many of us, Shauna says, our faith is just one more place where we get to measure ourselves up and find ourselves wanting. But what if our faith was the softest place in our lives, the place where we connect once again with a God who loves us unconditionally, where we feel healing and peace in our souls, where where our souls feel their worth again. When Paul writes to the early church, he, he doesn't say to them, what I need from you is for you to be more perfect for you to do a better job of memorizing scripture and defending the faith. I I need you to follow all the rules. I need you to be blameless in every possible way. You know, when he writes the early church in Ephesus, this is what he writes. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, that you may be rooted, connected, established in God's love, and then from that rootedness that you might overflow with all the fullness of God. It's not about perfection, it's about connection. Perfection will kill our souls. The health of our souls isn't found in being perfect. The health of our souls is found in resting in the love of a perfect God. I mean, I think sometimes when we pursue perfection, the reality is perfection is about image. It's what people get to see. And yet Shauna says that's what kills our souls the the most is image management. Because image management involves secret keeping and secret keeping over the long haul produces profound exhaustion. But Jesus says, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And what did he say? You will find rest and healing for your souls. Whatever voice is telling you you have to be perfect, that tyranny, that voice is not from God. This is God's voice. Jesus came and lived a perfect life so that that burden might be lifted from us. And he died upon the cross as a perfect offering so that we might once again understand the worth of our souls that God wants more than anything to connect with us, to restore us, to fill us with life and health and peace. And he will stop at nothing to do that. So today's All Saints, we lit candles earlier in the service. And whenever we talk about saints, isn't it funny that most of the time we talk about saints, we talk about them as if they're perfect. 
Like we say, oh, he's a saint, she's a, she's a saint. What we typically mean by that is they're, they're, they're so perfect, they're without sin, but, but sainthood is not about the absence of sin. Sainthood is about the presence of grace. A saint is someone who is experiencing grace every moment of their lives and who is extending grace to every single person they meet. You don't have to be a saint in order to receive grace. It's not something you earn, but you do have to receive grace in order to become a saint. And grace is available to every single one of us. Any moment that invitation of Jesus to come is available. The only thing we have to want is we have to want that grace and that connection more than we want this perfect life that we're holding on to. We have to be willing to lay down perfection. And I love how John Steinbeck puts it. He says, and once we don't have to be perfect, then you can be good. Then you can be the you that God created you to be. So how is it with your soul? I used to always think that that question necessitated a negative answer. Like I had to diagnose my spirit and find what was wrong and say, well, I'm too tired, I'm not good enough, I'm, I'm, I'm not. But what would it look like to answer that question in the positive? To say, you know what? My soul is being nude every single day by God's grace. You know what, my soul is being filled with peace and hope. The dino doesn't come from anywhere else except from God. You know what, it is well with my soul. And when it is well with our soul, then we return thanks to God with undying and eternal praise. That's where God is leading us. Amen. 